and Happy New Year. Welcome to Bento Lab's first Lab at Home vlog of 2022. When we were brainstorming ideas for upcoming vlogs, I was concerned that I've already shown you the basic steps of the DNA analysis workflow several times in previous vlogs and that it was in danger of becoming a little repetitive. But then when I thought about it again, I realised that DNA analysis is comprised of these basic steps. It sits within a framework of DNA extraction, PCR amplification, gel electrophoresis, and an optional sequencing step at the end. So when we at Bento Lab are getting new protocols to work or troubleshooting existing ones, we run these steps over and over again, often many times making tweaks and adjustments at each stage until we get the protocol to work perfectly. Therefore, it's not a bad thing, I don't think, to show you these steps um, quite often in these video blogs, because that is what's involved in DNA analysis. And that is what we are passionate about making accessible to you. So I'm hoping that when you see these framework and these steps repeated in my video blogs, it might show you that DNA analysis is not actually as complicated as perhaps you thought it was. And maybe it will inspire you to have a go at it yourself, which is what we're aiming with, aiming for with these video blogs. So today I'm going to just take you through that DNA analysis framework. I'm going to describe to you each step and what it does. And then in future blogs, when I uh, refer to these steps, you'll understand their importance and what I'm trying to achieve and tweak with each one. The first step in the DNA analysis framework is DNA extraction. And this involves removing the DNA from the cell membrane and the nuclear membrane that contains DNA. Uh, for bacteria, they don't even have a nuclear membrane, so that's, uh, step doesn't apply. Um, so first of all, you want to break open the cell membrane to release the cell contents. And then you want to break open the nuclear membrane to release your DNA. And then once that DNA is free, it's accessible for DNA analysis. Depending on the tissue type, there are different ways of um, extracting DNA. You can use chemicals. So for example, you can use an alkali or a salt solution. You can do it mechanically by grinding up your sample using a pestle and mortar or by heating it. Or you can use an enzyme. And a popular one is protonase K. You get a lot of kits uh, use multiple steps um, to get the DNA out. We at Bento Lab are aiming to be able to enable you to extract DNA from all different types of tissue. So be that fungi, plants, mammals, fish, birds or insects. We want to be able to supply you with reagents that you can use safely and easily and dispose of at home and with protocols that are not too time consuming or complicated, but we'll get you reliable amounts of DNA to take through to the next step. So the next step is PCR amplification. And this involves taking the DNA that you got from the DNA extraction step, which is going to be double stranded DNA then you want to break apart those double strands into single strands. And then you want to get some primers that are complementary to your single strands um, and span the region of DNA that you are interested in. So let's just indicate that here. And then you want to extend those primers all the way and they uh, always have direction, so extend it out this way, extend it out that way. And that way you result in two copies of your uh, DNA region of interest from the original what's called the template here. Yeah. So in order to be able to do that, we make what's called a master mix. And this always contains a DNA polymerase. 
which is an enzyme that uh, manufactures DNA. And it's usually TAC <coughs> polymerase, <coughs> which is a polymerase enzyme that comes from the bacteria Thermus aquaticus, which likes to live in hot springs. Therefore, the enzyme is stable at the high temperatures that we use in our PCR programs. You also put in a buffer, which creates the right conditions for your polymerase to be able to function. You add DNTPs, which is the name given to the A, T, C and G bases that make up DNA. So these are loose in the master mix. And then when it comes to this step here, where your polymerase wants to produce the new strand of DNA, it compiles them in the correct order according to your template DNA. You include magnesium chloride, <coughs> which allows the TAC to work effectively. Reverse and forward primers, which have been designed in advance to make sure that they uh, kneel to the correct locations of your template DNA in order to um, span this region that you're interested in. And then you top it up with PCR grade water and that ensures that every component in your master mix is at the correct concentration to be able to function. And then finally, you add your DNA from step one. So the next stage, once you've got um, your tubes full of master mix and DNA, is to put them on the PCR heat block. And a PCR is always comprised of, of three basic steps. So the first step is called denaturation. And this is the initial step that you'll see in a cycle of 94 to 95 degrees C. So for the first step, you'll put it on at two to three minutes. And then there's a subsequent denaturation step within a cycle, which is for between 10 to 30 seconds. And this denaturation step just breaks apart your double-stranded DNA by breaking the hydrogen bonds between the strands into single-stranded DNA. Next up, you have what's called the annealing step, which is a temperature between 50 to 65 um, degrees C, depending on um, the reaction that you're carrying out. Again, for 10 to 30 seconds. And this is um, where you anneal your primers onto the template DNA. And then you finish up with a step of usually 72 degrees C. And this is for one minute per 1000 bases that you're trying to produce. So for example, if you have a very short DNA region of interest, uh, you could hold this for less than a minute. Um, however, if you're looking to produce and amplify a longer region, you'd increase this, um, what's called the extension step. And then you usually finish up your PCR with an extension step of five minutes, just to make sure all of your um, new amplicons are the correct length. And then the final step, let me make sure you can see this, is to visualise your results using gel electrophoresis. And this is a brilliant way to tell whether your DNA extraction and PCR have been successful. So you make an agarose gel and you pour it into your gel tank. Leave that to set, cover it with TBE buffer. And then you load your samples from your PCR. along with your DNA ladder. So in your first well, you'll have your DNA ladder with these bands of known size. So for example, that bottom one will be 100 base pairs. For example, that top one would be 1,000 base pairs. And then you'll also load your samples and you'll run them for a set amount of time and your samples might come out like this. 
and then you use your DNA ladder as a key to find out the size of your DNA amplicons. Um, if there's nothing there, it means that something hasn't worked in the steps before. Um, but if there are nice neat bands, then you've been successful and hopefully your DNA amplicon is the size that it, you would expect for your DNA region of interest. And then following on from the gel electrophoresis, there's an optional step of uh, sending your uh, PCR amplicons, your DNA bands, for sequencing, in which case you will receive back the order of the base pairs in your DNA sequence. And you can compare that against online databases um, and find a match to identify your piece of DNA. And hopefully that would tell you, for example, what um, tissue type it came from. If you are using one of our DNA barcoding workloads, for example. OK, so perhaps maybe not the most beautiful um, piece of work I've ever produced. But um, hopefully that gives you some idea of what is involved in the DNA analysis workflow and why you can see these different components cropping up um, again and again in my video blogs. So I mentioned earlier about getting um, protocols to work and troubleshooting existing ones. Um, the things that I will be altering in upcoming vlogs and explaining to you as I go are these um, steps on how to uh, extract DNA. So for example, for, um, I have the fungal DNA barcoding working flow working really nicely um, because it works with both our hotshot DNA extraction kit, which uses a combination of alkaline heat um, and with our dipstick um, extraction kit, which uses a, a grinding up method. However, um, I'm going to be doing a little bit of troubleshooting, extracting DNA from feathers. That's up next. Um, then there's uh, modifications to uh, the PCR application. For example, you can use uh, different DNA polymerases. You can alter the concentration of MgCl2 and change the primers that you're using and the concentration of these. And even the amount of DNA you put in can affect uh, how your um, PCR turns out. You can also add in extra components to these master mixes um, to reduce, for example, PCR inhibition that results from sometimes these DNA extractions. Uh, you can vary all of these steps in your PCR, um, increase or decrease the time timing of the steps and alter these temperatures. Um, so your PCR can take from between an hour and a half to run to up to three hours. Uh, depending on how long you make those steps. And then even for the gel electrophoresis step, you can change the concentration of your agarose gel, um, change the quantity that, of DNA that you load or the duration of time that you run it for. So um, as you can imagine, there's almost an endless number of possibilities um, of how many things you can tweak and adjust to get a protocol to work. And uh, that's essentially what my job is as a molecular biologist, is to find that right combination of factors that enable you to get your uh, DNA analysis result um, that you want. So hopefully that has been interesting. Um, feel free to ask any questions in the comments that you might have. And uh, thanks for listening.